Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for another Radeon RX 6800 XT board partner card review. And this time we'll be looking at the Power Color Red Devil. Now, previously I've tested AMD's reference design along with the Sapphire Nitro Plus, so it will be good to get a third point of reference, and especially because the Red Devil was one of the absolute best 5700 XT graphics cards that I came across, and I pretty much looked at all of them. Also, towards the end of the video, I'm going to talk a bit about pricing and availability of these cards, as well as some viewer feedback. I've been very annoyed by all of this, and I know you guys have been as well, but again, we will talk about all of that towards the end of the video. So let's get right into it then. The Red Devil is a seriously big graphics card measuring 320 millimeters long. It's 135 millimeters tall and a whopping 62 millimeters wide. Therefore, in terms of volume, it is 17% larger than the Sapphire Nitro Plus, And in terms of weight, it is 30% heavier, tipping the scales at 1600 grams. Of course, as Power Colors flagship 6800 XT, they're really not messing around here. I just shudder to think how much this thing is going to cost, and we will talk a bit more about that towards the end of the video. Speaking to the fact that this is a premium product is the all aluminium design, which includes the fan shroud. Of course, the fans themselves are plastic, they're not looking to create a blender of fingers here, but having an aluminium shroud is a really nice touch. There's also a few translucent plastic bits embedded in the shroud for lighting effects, and we'll take a close look at those in a moment. Getting back to the fans though, there's three in total, but they're not all the same. The outer two fans are 100mm in diameter, while the centrally located fan is 90mm, but all do spin in the same counterclockwise direction. As for RGB lighting, the Red Devil looks quite impressive. Those translucent strips that I spoke of a moment ago look very good. There's some embedded at the end of the card, and those ones in particular look very cool. It's just a shame you can't see them more easily, but still a nice detail there. The card does look quite good mounted horizontally, but I think it looks best when mounted vertically. When mounted vertically, the red Wolverine looking slashes on the front of the card are more visible, though you won't notice the backlit Red Devil logo on the backplate. Anyway, if you care at all about RGB lighting effects, this card should impress. Around on the back side of the card is a full length backplate with a number of cutouts and a backlit dragon logo that we just spoke of. Now, for this review, I did receive a limited edition version and we got number 12 of 1000. This version comes with a set of custom Red Devil keycaps, so that's kind of neat. It's also worth noting that buyers of the limited edition version will also receive a Devil's user membership, and this gives you access to stuff like news, competitions, downloads, and instant support via live chat. Regardless of which model you purchase, the card itself is very similar, and therefore we are looking at an identical backplate. Though do note there are some small changes, namely to the IO, and we'll look at that in a moment. Like what we saw with the Nitro Plus, the end of the card has been opened up to increase airflow, something we first started seeing quite regularly with the new GeForce 30 series. Then around at the I.O. end of the card, there's a single HDMI 2.1 port and two DisplayPort 1.4 outputs along with a USB Type-C. At least this is the configuration for the limited edition models. The standard Red Devil models will dump the Type-C port for a third DisplayPort, so the same configuration that we found on the Nitro Plus. Both versions do feature LED backlit ports, so you can see what's going on in the dark, or when connecting cables under your desk, for example. Okay, so that's enough looking around the card, time to tear it down. After removing a series of screws from the back side of the card, the cooler can be removed, and unlike the Nitro Plus, we're looking at one massive cooler that tackles everything. This behemoth weighs 1,151 grams and features two huge banks of aluminium fins connected using five nickel plated copper heat pipes. The middle three are eight millimeter pipes with the outer pipes measuring six millimeter in diameter. Now, connecting the cooler to the GPU die as well as the 8G DDR6 memory chips is a nickel plated copper base. Then cooling the 19 power stages are two aluminium plates connected directly to the main heatsink. Power color isn't actively cooling the inductors though, so most of that heat will be dumped into the PCB, which is interesting as the backplate hasn't been used as a heat spreader, rather it's just a shield. So it'll be very interesting to see just how hot the GDDR6 and VRM components get. Then over on the 260 millimeter long PCB, we find a robust VRM packing 19 power stages, along with a pair of eight pin PCIe power connectors and a dual BIOS switch. Now for the power stages, power colors using Infineon's TDA2147-2 Optimos power stages, which are rated for 70 amp capacity. 16 have been used to deliver power to the GPU, 14 for GFX, and two for SOC. 
Then in addition to that, there's a single phase for GPU power, VDDCI, and two phases for GDDR6 memory. Now, in terms of clock specifications, Sapphire lists a boost clock frequency of 2,340 MHz, which is a mere 4% increase over the 2,250 MHz default spec set by AMD. The GDDR6 memory, on the other hand, that has been left stock at 16 gigabits per second. So when compared to other factory OC graphics cards, a 4% overclock is very mild. So it will be interesting to see just how much OC headroom is left to play with. Playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider for 30 minutes saw the Red Devil peak at 72 degrees in a 21 degree room inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, fully populated with fans. That's just 3 degrees cooler than the AMD reference card, though keep in mind power consumption has increased by about 7%, and the fan speed has been slightly reduced, so that is a very good result. Speaking of fan speed, in order to maintain this temperature, the fan spun at just 1400 RPM, which is a very low fan speed. The typical core clock speed seen during our testing was 2340 MHz, and that saw power consumption for just the graphics card hit 318 watts, so a 7% increase over the AMD reference model. Now for overclocking, with the peak limits reached, we actually saw the temperature drop down to 68 degrees, but this time the fans were spinning at 1900 RPM, so a significant increase in fan speed there, though given the rather extreme overclock, I think it's fair to say the fans were relatively quiet. And this overclock did see the cores operate at an incredible 2690 megahertz, so 2.7 gigahertz in other words, and the memory was limited to 17.2 gigabits per second, and this is a current limit enforced by AMD. Finally, when overclocked, the card sucked down 335 watts, so a 5% increase from the stock factory OC configuration, which is very surprising. Okay, so let's move into the benchmark graphs. As usual, we're testing with our AMD Ryzen 9 3950X GPU test rig with 32GB of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. The latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used, and for this one we have just a few select games to look at. Now, for these custom AIB reviews, I don't bother with many game tests. We've already done all of that, so there's plenty of data in our day one coverage. What we're going to do here is just have a quick look at out-of-the-box performance along with our manual overclock in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. At 1440p, we're looking at a mere 2% performance improvement for the Red Devil over the AMD reference card, though I was able to squeeze a further 8% from it with my manual overclock. That meant when fully overclocked, we're looking at an 11% improvement over the stock AMD reference card. Here we're seeing that the gains at 4K are a little bit more impressive. Here the Red Devil was 4% faster than the AMD reference model out of the box, and then 15% faster once overclocked. That's quite an impressive result, and it placed the Red Devil between the RTX 3080 and 3090, albeit a stock 3080 and stock 3090. It was also 5% faster than the best overclock I could achieve on the Sapphire Nitro Plus, but that's not to say the Red Devil is a much better overclocker. We're likely looking at a difference in silicon quality. Interestingly, out of the box, the Red Devil only consumed 7% more power than the AMD reference model, and that meant it used 5% less power than the Nitro Plus. In fact, once overclocked to 2.7 GHz, power usage for the Red Devil was only on par with the stock Nitro Plus, so that's quite an impressive achievement. But again, this could just be a result of silicon quality. Okay, so looking at the stock out-of-the-box temperatures, we see that the Red Devil saw a peak GPU temperature of just 72 degrees after half an hour in Shut Off the Tomb Raider inside an ATX case in a 21 degree room. That's quite an impressive result given the low fan speed. Even more impressive are the GDDR6 and VRM temperatures. We're looking at a 6 degree reduction for the memory temperature when compared to the Nitro Plus and a 3 degree drop for the VRM. So out of the box, the Red Devil is a very cool and quiet graphics card. Now, noise normalized. The power color Red Devil is just as impressive, running a degree cooler than the Nitro Plus for the GPU, but seven degrees cooler for the memory and four degrees cooler for the VRM. That said, as impressive as the Red Devil is here, the Nitro Plus and AMD reference cards are also very good. And you're not really gonna notice a difference between any one of these three models. The Powercolor Red Devil is an exceptionally good Radeon RX 6800 XT graphics card, so much so that I'm not really expecting to come across a model that's much better. Of course, we do have many more models to check out, but given how cool and quiet this thing was, and how much of an overclocking beast my particular card was, I can't see anyone going too wrong with this thing. That is, assuming that you can actually get one to begin with at a reasonable price, which evidently you can't. Okay, so I've actually had to go back and redo this entire section of the video now that I have firm pricing information. 
Basically, prior to release, Power Color refused to give reviewers any indication of how much the Red Devil was going to cost, or should cost, so no MSRP, nothing. Now, they claimed they were withholding this information due to the fact that they felt it was disingenuous to quote prices you're unlikely to see, at least in the short term. They provided numerous examples of RTX 3070 graphics cards that were meant to be selling at the $500 US MSRP, yet none of them are, and some examples were selling at a $60 to $70 premium, and we're talking about base models claimed by the manufacturer to cost $500 US. Therefore, I believe in the short term, PowerColor feels pricing is out of their hands and wish to avoid quoting unrealistic prices. They have stressed that they're not the ones increasing the price, in fact, they say margins are at a historic low for a new product, somewhere in the range of 10%. And this really does mean that it has to be AMD who's pulling a bait and switch here with the MSRP, claiming $650 with the reference model, but in reality, no AIB models will sell at that price, at least in the short term. And this is exactly what Nvidia has been accused of doing with their GeForce 30 series, and it's exactly what they did with the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. We've always said AMD is not your friend, and it seems they're going out of their way to prove us right. Just yesterday, I reviewed the Nitro Plus, and again, Sapphire wouldn't give me the price and time to complete my review. In fact, they didn't even tell me the price until after the reviews went live, and now I know why. The price is absolutely outrageous. It's a complete disgrace. Again, AMD claimed an MSRP of $650 US, so I'd consider $700, $50 over the MSRP, as the absolute most you could charge for a premium air-cooled model. So, color me surprised when I woke up to learn that the Nitro Plus had been listed for $770 US. $770 US. That really is a disgusting premium. No wonder they wouldn't tell me the price. And just to be clear, $770 US is the official MSRP for that card. But I don't think Sapphire is to blame here, though I don't appreciate their lack of transparency either. But I have heard from multiple AIBs that the margins are extremely low on these RTX 6800 series graphics cards. So it certainly does appear to be AMD who's playing dirty here. I should also emphasize that it's not distributors or retailers who are to blame. The MSRP for these models is well over $750 US. Again, $800 US in the case of the Red Devil. For example, the 5700 XT, which AMD quoted a $400 US MSRP for, the Red Devil model launched at $40 US over the base MSRP. So a 10% premium, which is quite reasonable and traditionally what we've come to expect. So compare that to the PowerColor Red Devil Limited Edition, which is the only PowerColor model listed right now. But let's be honest, they're all pretty much limited editions at this point in time with virtually no supply. Anyway, it costs $800 US. 800 freaking dollars US. And that's the MSRP. That really is outrageous, a 23% markup. In my opinion, nobody should be spending much over $700 US on an air-cooled Radeon RX 6800 XT graphics card. And in fact, I would beg you guys not to spend more than $700 US on one of these cards. Please do not do that. But of course, the problem is with such extreme demand and so many desperate shoppers, these companies, in this case AMD, know that they can get away with charging just about anything, and therefore they are. I'm not exactly sure how to proceed at this point. We have a few more really nice looking 6800 XT graphics cards on hand for review. And I really do want to give you guys all the data on how they perform. So if and when the pricing settles down, you'll be able to make an informed purchase. But I also know that a lot of you are frustrated by seeing reviews of products you can't yet buy. Personally, I think this content is very beneficial to the viewers, as we can inform you ahead of time as to which cards are worth buying and which ones you should potentially avoid. And we also get to expose anti-consumer behavior, like what we believe we're seeing here from AMD. And in the past, we have seen some pretty horrible quality AIB cards that people have absolutely got burnt by when purchasing. So. If we can at least avoid that from happening again, I think getting these reviews out as soon as possible is worth it. Anyway, guys, I am just as disappointed as you are. And frankly, I'm really pissed off at this point and I'm kind of getting over this industry. We went from horrid availability and horrendous price scalping with the GeForce 10 and Vega series during the cryptocurrency boom. Then a complete lack of competition led to no improvements in price to performance with the GeForce 20 series. And now we have this mess. Tim and I will no doubt continue this discussion tomorrow in our Q&A series, so I'll do a bit more digging before then, but this really does look to be a case of AMD playing dirty. 
Now, if you appreciate this video, please do hit the like button. Also, you can join us over on Patreon or Floatplane, where you will have full availability to our service, and you can join tomorrow's live stream uh, that, again, will be available to Floatplane and Patreon members. We also have behind-the-scenes content, Q&As, and an exclusive Discord chat. So, again, if you're interested, check them out. The links for that stuff are in the video description. But if not, that is perfectly fine. I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.